Give yourselves a round of applause. So in case, I know I've kind of gauged the crowd, about 50% of the audience has been uh, at one of our events or visited the space, so thank you for coming back. Um, wherever it was located, down here uh, on the Lower East Side or here in the center. Um, in case you don't know, I'm Donnie and my partner Greg is in the back. Um, we're the Bureau of Criminal Services. Um, and with a lot of help of volunteers, we do what we do, and Roberto is our bartender tonight, so thank him as well. Um, a few things just to share with you about us. We started um, a couple of years ago, it's going to be nearly three, um, we came up with the idea, um, we were a little frustrated that there was not a gay bookstore in Manhattan. So it started there from a source of frustration and morphed into a fantasy project of let's open a queer bookstore for New York and then it had to be something more than a bookstore, so then it became an event space that had varied readings, performances, etc. So we wanted a community space. So that's kind of where we went and what we've been doing. So. Um, uh, stay in touch with us, please. You can stay in touch through Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter. We have a website, email address on the back. There's a clipboard. But any ideas you have for events that we can have here, if you want to host your own event, we open. We are open to the ideas. We're welcome to you participating in that. Larry has actually done that quite a few times now. So thank you again for tonight. Um, so we're running a lot of help from the community. It's not just the two of us. So any ideas and thoughts you have are welcome. Um, beyond that, we are separate from the center, so we're still our own business, but the center is hosting us, so we love being here and being part of the community and being in the central spot with them, um, and we've been here since October. Um, shop, visit, hang out after the event is over this evening. We stay open until the, event, um, the center closes, which is 10 o'clock. So there's no rush to leave afterwards, and that's kind of why we created this space for socialization. Buy zines. Buy zines, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> so um, zines, books, and uh, we have rolling art exhibitions. And right now, Ephraim Gonzalez is up with the West Side 70s and 80s photographs that he's been taking um, during the course of his life. And this is just one of the eras that he took. So uh, have a look at those as well. Um, and with that, yeah. With that, I will pass it over to Larry, who will take us on to the rest of our evening. Um, we have a couple of book of Mark's books left, so if you want to purchase one, there are maybe three left. So thank you for tonight, and hang out afterwards. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to introduce Mark by talking about how he's impacted my life and my poems and my relationship with poetry. I've been reading Mark for 14 years, and I was thinking about that as the reading was approaching and how my life has really changed since I first read Homo Will Not Inherit in an anthology called The World and Us, Gay and Lesbian Poetry of the Next Generation. And when I read that poem, I felt so um, validated in a way by the voice and the need for visibility as a gay man and the need to express one's feelings and one's desires and one's questions. And I felt like I can ask my own questions within the poem and not necessarily have the answers, but to really begin thinking about what I wanted to say inside the poem. But he's taught me a lot of things over the years by reading his poems. I mean, by looking at his description and how he does that, and how he uses different techniques book by book has been a really great study into how I approach description and, and wrestle with how I want to do that in my own poems. Um, so I've been thinking about all that, and then I've been thinking about how I want to write a new kind of poem. Because for me, it's so easy to write a poem that's already familiar, or that I've already done before, or that, you know, is, is easy to write, I guess. Um, but that's not really what I'm interested in doing, because that's not challenging, and that's not as rewarding for myself, or 
for the reader, if there's a reader. Um, so I was thinking about what Mark has been doing, and the way he challenges, challenges himself in his poems and in his books. I was thinking about when I first read School of the Arts, and you know, I was a little bit disappointed at first when I wrote that book because it's so spare in my mind, and it's really cutting down a lot of what he's doing in, say, Atlantis and Sweet Machine. But I bring this up because I admire the risks that he takes in his poems and his willingness to challenge himself book by book, and in the new book too, to move away from what's easy and move away from what's comfortable for himself and for the reader, I think. And be open to, I don't know, some kind of surprise in, I'm guessing, not knowing what will happen in the poem, but having that openness and curiosity to find out instead of writing the same kind of poem because people like those poems, you know, people love the poems from Maya Alexandria, people love the poems from Atlantis. He certainly could have done that time and time again. But part of what I admire so much is that he's challenged himself and done something new, book by book. And part of what I love so much about Deep Lane is the freshness and the um, questions that he's wrestling with in these poems that feel new in a way um, that is very resonant and exciting. And I feel very proud of him to see how he's grown as a poet, and how he's grown as a teacher, and um, it's just really exciting that the book is finally out. I've been reading about the book and reading poems from the book for a few years now, so I'm personally very, very excited that the book is out in the world. Um, and if you haven't already bought it, I hope that you consider <laughs> buying it. Um, I don't think he needs very formal introduction. I'll quickly say, if you don't already know, he's the author of four books of prose in addition to his nine books of poems. Uh, Dog Ears, which was a New York Times bestseller, a really fantastic book-length essay on Dutch still life paintings called Still Life with Oysters and Lemon. And most recently, a really fantastic book in the Grey Wolf series called The Art Of, where poets and fiction writers are writing about different subjects or themes like the art of syntax or the art of the poetic line or um, the art of taking risks in poems, and Mark has a fantastic one called The Art of Description. Uh, he teaches at Rutgers in New Brunswick and lives in New York and on the eastern end of Long Island. Please warmly welcome Mark Doby. So how's that sound there? Is it too much? Is it good? Okay. If it's if it's either too big or too low, there's gonna be people in the back who can make gestures, mind something. <laughs> uh, I, thanks, Larry, for, for that very much and for organizing this evening. And my thanks to the guys who have made this amazing space. Um, it makes me think about uh, the late James Merrill, who had a study in which he used to write, which was totally lined with books, including the back of the door, so that when you shut the door, you didn't know where the door was, you were just in his chamber. It's like being inside the mind of James Merrill, which is a scary idea, but um, it was also glorious. And so to be surrounded by these books yeah, was really, really good. Um, what Larry said makes me think about the way that we never get done with the need for encouragement, you know? And, and, I, and I think encourage, you know, in the, you know, the etymological sense, to be given heart to encourage. Hmm? And when a younger poet says, you gave me nerve, or you gave me something I could use, or, or I could speak because of something you said, the result of that for me is that I feel encouraged. Like, okay, somebody could use that. Um, let's see what else I could do. And so I'm very heartened by that, thank you. This book um, is called Deep Lane. Um, it's the name of a road near uh, a house I have out in, uh, it's just above Amagansett, um, and the South Fork. And Deep Lane is a very nice little country road. But in fact, what I really love about it is the name. The 
two monosyllables, deep lane, the two long vowels, deep lane, the sense of sort of going forward and down. As soon as I encountered that road, that phrase began to sort of repeat and echo for me and to suggest meanings, to draw possibilities unto itself. And so I wrote a poem called Deep Lane. And when I was finished, I realized I hadn't even scratched the surface of, of that metaphor or emblem or psychic space, whatever it is. So I wrote another one. And now there are nine poems in this book called Deep Lane, which is a wonderful strategy for those of you who are poets and you have trouble with titles. You know, you just <laughs> <laughs> fix yourself to something and go there. Um, this is one reason that title was resonant for me is that this is very much a book about um, going down into difficulty. Um, it's a book that began uh, in Syria, like almost close to my mid fifties, which for me was a period of um, confrontation with all kinds of, of difficulty. Really, the things I had held at bay for a long time, uh, mortality being one of them, uh, the end of marriage being another, um, the fear of moving into a time of life when I might be moving out of a sexual sphere, um, which turned out not to be true. Uh, <laughs> all that stuff about that daddy is absolutely true. Um, uh, you know, and, and worse, I think in a way the worse it is, the old demons, the things that I thought I had laid to rest about my family, um, were not laid to rest at all. You know, I simply held things at bay. And so the book is in some ways a confrontation with many issues among them a sense of futility. So, um, with that cheery introduction, it, I, I don't think it's a dark book. I think it's, um, it's an attempt to move forward, and there is hope in every attempt. Huh? So I begin with a poem from this series of Deep Lane Poems, and this one has to do with the work of gardening. When we're doing that labor, if that's something you love, you pour yourself into it, and there are moments when I think, who is this for? You know, well, why am I doing this intense work? The poet, poem also remembers uh, the late Deborah Diggs, who was a marvelous poet who died uh, now about four years ago. Deep Lane. When I'm down on my knees, pulling up wild mustard by the roots before it sets seed, hauling the old ferns further into the shade, I'm talking to the anvil of darkness. Break table. Slab, no blow, could dent, run with the making, and out of that chop and rot comes the fresh surf of the lupins. When the shovel slips into white root flesh, into the meat coursing with cool water, when I'm grubbing on my knees, what is the hammer? Dusty skin of the tuber, naked worms who write on the soil, every letter, my companion blind, all day we go digging, harrowing, rooting deep. Spade plunge and trowel, Sweet turned down gas flame, slow charring carbon, out of which sprouts the wild unsayable. Beauty's the least of it. You get ready, like Deborah, who used to garden in the dark, hauling out candles and a tall glass of what she said was tea, and digging and reading and studying in the dirt. She'd bring a dictionary. If study is prayer, she said, I'm praying. If you've already gone down to the anvil, if you've rested your face on that adamant, maybe you're already changed. But that began, I ordered a, something from a garden catalog, which means that immediately you get like 200 more garden catalogs. <laughs> and one of them was for uh, a company that uh, sold bearded iris, which are the most outrageously hybridized of flowers. And there was a plant called Anvil of Darkness. In fact, can you imagine choosing to grow the anvil? <laughs> I thought I was going to write this little sort of comic poem about that, and you can see the turning so instead. <laughs> there are also a group of poems in this book with the title of Apparition. And well, before we go there. One more of those deep land poems. The character you'll meet in this poem is my dog Ned, who is a golden retriever. He is um, a prime exemplar of his breed. <laughs> deep lane. June 23rd, evening of the first fireflies. We're walking in the cemetery down the road, and I look up from my distracted study of whatever, an unfocused gaze somewhere a few feet in front of my shoes, and see that Ned has run on ahead, with the champagne plume of his tail held especially high, his head erect 
which is often a sign that he has something he believes he is not allowed to have. And in the gathering twilight, what is it that is doing the gathering? Who is doing the harvesting? I can make out that the long horizontal between his lovely jaws is one of the four stakes planted on the slope to indicate where the backhoe will dig a new grave. Of course, my impulse is to run after him, out of respect for the rule that we won't desecrate the tombs, or at least for those who knew the woman whose name inks a placard in the rectangle claimed by the four poles of vanishing, three poles now, and how it's within their recollection, their gathering, she'll live. Evening of memory, spark lamps in the grass. I stand and watch him go in his wild figure eights. I say, you run, darling, you tear up that hill. As if you needed any encouragement from me. <laughs> Apparition. I'm carrying an orange plastic basket of compost down from the top of the garden. Sweet, dark, fibrous rock promising. When the light changes, as if someone's flipped a switch that does what? Reverses the day. Leaves chorusing, dizzy. And then my mother says, she's been gone more than 30 years. Not her voice, the voice of her in me. You've got to forgive me. I'm choked and sputter in the wild daylight, speechless to that. Maybe I'm really crazy now, but I believe in the backwards morning I am my mother's son. We are at last equally in love with intoxication. I am unregenerate. The trees are on fire. Fifty-eight years of lost bells. I drop my basket and stand struck in the iron mouth afternoon. She says, I never meant to harm you. Then the young dog barks down by the front gate. He's probably gotten out. And she says, calmly, clearly, go take care of your baby. I banished my parents from my poetry for, let's see, uh, since 1992. <laughs> so, and they appear, of course. <laughs> Apparition. At the kitchen sink, trimming the lower blooms from forsythia I've cut in the front garden, starting to set them into the low, thick glass vase, and my father says, Mark is making the house pretty. He didn't speak to me the last five years of his life. Why should I be surprised he'd use the third person now? Though he did make sure I heard him, didn't he? He did say my name so that I could hear him. And I think it was in gentleness, a compliment, and not in mockery. Stop. This poem begins in the experience. I know some of you have had this experience. You know when you, you sort of sign on for something that seems a little too new age to really be you know, sort of incredible. <laughs> and then it sort of works on you anyway. <laughs> Against your better judgment. One of those. This is called God Box. So the new book is I don't know how to find things. God box. They give us a white cube, a paper box, the kind that might hold a small gift, and ask us to write or draw on its surface our image of the divinity, whatever that might be. We're here. We have, in principle, already agreed. Daniel's octopus is a Buddha. Glenn's highest self a blazing star, though no marker is adequately golden. In my future blue, one hand blooms from the next in a rush of wind from another life. Step two, write on an index card what you most want to be released from. Fold it, place it inside, close the lid. That's it. That's the end of the exercise. Walking home on six, thinking it's intention, not artifact that matters, I'm inclined to toss the thing away. But I wind up walking blocks holding this coffer, only a little bigger than my hand. Steam blurs the bank's bright windows. Glassy slab of winter twilight over the stairs to the subway. Then I'm down to the station, restless, walking the long platform. And here's the unknowable of music, too far to name. Keep walking, the violin, sonorous, emotive. Closer, resolute travelers facing the tracks, but the rest of us turn toward the man whose powers concentrate on his instrument, from which pours, how is it possible, an aching distillate so exact, I don't need to go anywhere. CD for sale in the velvet cavity beside his shoes. Two dollar bills, gleaming change. Odd bit of movement across the tracks. 
so I can't help but look toward the platform. A tall black man, why does this darkness seem to matter? Cravingly, a vile wind isn't there. Invisible chin rest beneath his jaw. Immaterial body resting on the shoulder of his coat. And the bow that isn't there, lifted and lowered precisely. Not mimicry. He knows the music. On my side of the double tracks, the tunnel fills with an embodied grief, too poised to be an outcry, contained, larger than any single suffering. And the man on the other side makes nothing, no sound at all, but answers adequately. What did I write on that card? One blue hand folding out of another. One golden octopus, one embattled star. This box in these hands that have done so much to harm myself. This box. So this is one of the only audiences on Earth to which I need say nothing about Fire Island Pines. <laughs> There is one word in the poem that might not be familiar, which is a gnomon, which is the, um, uh, the, the dial on a sundial, and it casts a shadow, so you know what time it is. This is called The King of Fire Island. I was trying to imagine if it takes on any different resonance in the light of recent events, you know. I don't think so. A, a certain note of cynicism about the pines you might notice here, might simply have been slightly magnified. <laughs> the King of Fire Island. Hard by our fence in tea dance light, he seemed the very model of his kind. A buck in velvet at the garden rim, bronze lightly shagged, split thumbs of antlers budding. That odd way deer hold extra still, as though there were degrees of stasis. We were objects of his regal, mild regard. Did I really say T? Measure the afternoon by a bar event? Here it's a fixed point, no mon of the day. Our island scattered men gather near seven and stand with cocktails in the thick of buzzing bodies, intent and quick talk, though their subtle eyes won't miss a trick. Here, after all, tea dance started. Wise strategy for an island with no street lamps, boardwalks pitching along the dunes, scary after drinks, far better navigated before nightfall. He stepped toward us an unexpected lurch, and then we saw. One front leg nearly tapered to a whisper, like the torso of a cartoon ghost. No hoof. He gladly accepted a carrot, a gesture plainly familiar. Where else could he have lived? No cars, no hunting, visitors would bring in kitchen scraps, nothing to trouble but cameras buzzing their automatic flash, or dance music blooming from some big box rental, and ticks. He wore a small crown of swollen passengers between his two brave ears where he could not bite them, and no other deer provided the seemingly secret grooming they perform. He exhaled a small puff of carrot-scented wind. Handsome face, expressive. Not much in doubt of a human. We'd see him evenings up the walk, browsing the cranberry bar. He hauled himself through gardens, intently working tufts of grass, muscled shoulder pulling in the head. A hoof's a deft accomplishment that hard sheen shoe of blue-black carbon that he'd learned to do with what he had. I brought him celery. He liked corn silk, but not the husks, and seemed to prefer the leaves of sassafras with their faint spice scent. Something, did I imagine it? Seemed to pass across his gaze as he took them in, lower jaw working horizontally, a faint tearing sound. Then he'd take his tongue to my hands. They startled me at first, those sucking lips around my fingertips careful, as if he were grooming another of his kind. I felt I could lay my hand on that long slope of forehead, or stroke behind the ears, that whatever was left of his wildness needed to stand. I tried to name him, he wanted no word from me. More likely I should be subject to this monarch of holly, hobbling prince of Shadlow Grove, our island's crippled king. When July mounted to its zenith, his antlers turned in oddly, each mirroring the other. Wouldn't they collide? What grows in toward itself? How can it find company among its kind? I went looking, spent daylilies in hand, but if a white tail flashed, it wasn't his. Paul said, you can't will him to show up. 
out there somewhere in the leaf realms of August, lurching alone through all that glory. In the distance, the party thundered, season climbing to its apogee. Big speakers dragged out to the shore where midnight lapped the snow fence, and dreamers swayed and danced, held one another for themselves. And though the artificial mist tried to complicate the twittering sky field of laser lights, a real fog put the false to shame. In November, Paul saw him grazing a thicket of the yellowing bog. Not again. Then, late winter, a hushed, not quite scrutable rumor on the ferry, a deer's head floating in the bay, wreathed with flowers, evidence of ritual murder, Santeria, never to be mentioned again. Bad for business. Knowledge no summer of winter required. My friend, have I any right to call on that? He could hardly flee. But listen, I saw my own severed head on slip to the floor, a glazed, paltry thing, open eye looking up toward my subjectivity as if through a bloody gel. So much for the notion you can't die in a dream. I was the witness I've always been. Likewise beheaded, would you allow me now to do what I would not when you were living and take in my hands those twin branches sturdy as oars? Can't I take hold of you in the water, in the dark, floating in the gift of flowers, not lurching, steady, easy. Now guide me out of the story, spirit. I don't know where it is you lead, but I believe. You must have been weary of that form, as I grow weary of my head, and leave it behind, cast off thing, and lend my body to your severed crown. So, uh, when I had finished that poem, I made a little note to myself on the bottom. It was basically a joke. I, wrote, I lost my head. <laughs> and I forgot to take it off when I sent the poem to Maisie. And proofs come back and says, I lost my head. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think I said that already. <laughs> oh. This is probably about losing your head in a different way. Um, in Zen Buddhism, there's a notion of the hungry ghost who is uh, one who, who dies uh, in a state of craving and um, continues to, to, to live with insatiable desire. Um, there's an amazing ceremony in Zen Buddhism that happens in the fall. It, it's sort of, in some American Zen centers, it's kind of a Halloween ceremony. And you put out all this food, and then the priest calls the hungry ghost to come, and then makes horrible noises to scare them away. You know, the status get out of here. <laughs> hungry ghost. Even if I understood, even if I understood what the teacher said, that my desire was a thirst for something beyond forms, I believed I would be incomplete if I did not know longing. I would miss nothing, wanted to be marked by the passage, wanted to be inscribed. And then I was given the key to a wanting that won't stop as long as I live. Where was my gracious consent to attachment then? I was taught to say, please, sir, may I have more? Taught by craving, by the roar in the blood rising without volition. No place to stand, I did not lean forward, no still point. I harrowed sleep and memory, descended into the purely physical howl of the world, learned my size in relation to appetite, from which I could no more step back than I could change the eyes through which I read this page. When I'm gone, will I stop wanting? Perhaps this is also a form of immortality, submission to a craving without boundary, to be ravenous and lack of mouth. Shortly after Larry and I became friends, or around the time we became friends, he had a job at the Museum of Modern Art. This endeared Larry to me greatly because it meant I could get in on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, to be alone in a room full of de Kooning's or Pollock's is a completely different experience, and, and one in which that work can open itself to in a different way. Um, Jackson Pollock painted about a mile away from where my house is out in the country. Um, his barn studio is still standing, you can visit it, and it seems to be one of those spaces that vibrates with the great psychic drama of what took place within it. Um, it's by a beautiful salt marsh called Akabonic Harbor, I guess in here. And um, I think that's all you need to know. This is called To Jackson Pollock. I read this in Boston last week. And I 
Q&A, a woman raised her hand and said, I knew Jackson Paul. We this whole conversation is extraordinary. It's like, I knew him. Who? Lincoln. <laughs> to Jackson Pollock. Last night, somebody murdered a young tree on 7th Avenue between 18th and 19th. Only two in that block. And just days ago, we'd taken refreshment in the crisp and particular shade of that young ginkgo's tight leaves. It's beauty and optimism. Though I didn't think of that word until the snap trunk this morning, a broken broomstick discarded, and tell me what pleasure could you take from that? Maybe I understand it, the sudden surge of rage and the requirement of the gesture. But this hour, I place myself firmly on the side of thirst, the sapling's ambition to draw from the secret streams beneath this city to lift up our subterranean waters. Power in a pointless scrawl now on the pavement. Pollock, when he swung his wild arcs in the barn air by Akabonic, stripped away incident and detail till all that was left was swing and fall and return. Austere rhythm, deep down things, beautiful, because he subtracted the specific stub and pith, this wreck on the too hot pavement where scavengers spread their secondhand books in the scalding sunlight. Or maybe he didn't. Erase it, I mean. Look into the fierce ellipse of his preserved gesture, and hasn't he swept up every bit, all the busted and incomplete, half finished and lost? Alone in the grand rooms of last century's heroic painters, granted entrance on an off day to a museum with nobody, thank you, this once, nobody talking, for the first time I understood his huge canvases were prayers, no matter what, and silent as hell. He wrote the huge engine of his attention toward silence, and silence emanated from them, and they would not take no for an answer, though there is no other. Forget supplication, beseechment, praise. Look down into it, the smash-up swirl, oil and pigment and tree shatter, tumult in equilibrium. So if that's the city, you know, in sort of creative destructive phase, one side and several for another. This um, this is a city poem which has to do initially with what happens when we lose something familiar, when habit is broken. And it seems to me that if you live in New York or maybe any big city, habit is really your friend. You know, what coffee shop you go to in the morning? You don't want to think about that. You know, who's going to get your haircut? I mean, these things that are, are just you don't want to bother with occupying space in your mind. You know? So they, they become familiar rituals that claim a neighborhood, that claim relationships. <coughs> this is called, for reasons which will become clear in a moment, this your home. <coughs> for years, I went to the Peruvian barbers on 18th Street. Comforting, welcome. The full coat rack, three chairs held by three barbers, eldest by the window, the middle one, a slight fellow who spoke an oddly feminine Spanish, the youngest last, red-haired, self-consciously masculine, and in each of the mirrors, their children's photos, mildly smutty cartoons, postcards from Machu Picchu. I was happy in any chair, though I liked best the touch of the eldest who'd rest his hand against my neck in a thoughtless, confident way. Ten years, maybe. One day, the powdery blue steel shutters pulled down over the window and door, not to be raised again. They'd lost their lease. I didn't know how I'd have lost, I'd feel. This haze around what I'd like to think the sculptural presence of my sculpt requires neither art nor science, but two haircuts on seventh, one in Dublin, nothing right. Then, I hear my friend Marie laughing over my shoulder, saying, in your poems there's always a then, and I think, is it a poem without a then? Dull early winter, back on 18th, up spiraling red in a cylinder of glass, and just below the London sidewalk, a new sign, Willie's Barbershop. Dark hallway, glass door, and there's presumably Willie. When I tell him I used to go down the street, he says in an inscrutable accent, this your home now, puts me in a chair, asks me what I want, and soon he's clipping and singing with the radio's Latin dance tune. That's when I notice Willie's walls, though he's been here all the week, spangled with images hung in barbershops, since the beginning of time. Lounge singers, near celebrities, random boxers, Italian boys, Puerto Rican, caught in the hour of their beauty, though they'd scowl at the word. Victors cheering over a trophy, one for one. Frames already dusty at slight angles, 
Here it's clear forever. Are barbershops like aspens, each grown from a common root 10,000 years old? Sons of one father, flashing fibers and starlets to shield their tender the tenderness at their hearts? Our guardian really defies time, his chair our fairy goat, and we go down in the trance of touch and the skull buzz drone, singing cranial nerves in the direction of peace. And so I understand that in the back of this nothing building on 18th Street, I found that door ajar before in daylight, when it shouldn't be, some forgotten bulb left burning in a fathomless shaft of my uncharted nights. The men I have outlived await their turns, the fevered and wasted, whose mothers and lovers scattered their ashes and gave away their clothes. Twenty years, and their names tumble into a numb well, though in truth I have not forgotten one of you, may I never forget one of you. These layers of men, arrayed in their no longer breathing ranks. Willie, I have not lived well in my grief for them. I have loved this weight from place to place as though it were mine to account for. And today I sit in your good chair in the sixth decade of my life. And if your back door is a threshold of the kingdom of the lost, yours is a steady hand on my shoulder. Go down into the still waters of this chair and come up refreshed, ready to face the avenue. Maybe I do believe we will not be left comfortless. After everything comes tumbling down, or you tear it down, and stumble in the shadow valley trenches of the moon, there's still a decent chance that a barbershop, salsa on the radio, the instruments of renewal, wielded effortlessly. And who'd have thought? For you. Willie, if he is Willie, thus is much longer over my head than my head merits, which allows me to be grateful without qualification. Could I be a little satisfied? There's a man who loves me, our dogs, 15, 20 more good years if I'm a bit careful. It's what I haven't written. It's sunny out, though cold. Mm -hmm. After I tip Willie, I'm going down to Jane Street to a coffee shop I like. And then I'm going to write this poem. Then. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to end with um, a poem which was asked you to. Um, mm -hmm. Just remember hydrangeas and beautiful garden flowers, which are, are they're nice when they're fresh, but, but as they fade, they get better. The colors get more complicated. Beautiful. It's called Spent. Late August morning, I go out to cut spent and faded hydrangeas, wash greens, russets, troubled little aurals of sky, as if these were the very silks of Versailles, modeled by rain and ruin, then half restored after all this time. When I come back with my handful, I realize I've accidentally locked the door, and I can't get back into the house. The dining room window's easiest. Crawl through beauty bush and spirea, push aside some errant maples, take down the wood frame screen, hoist myself up, but how exactly to clamber down to the tile? I try bending one leg in, but I don't fold literally. I push myself up so that my waist rests against the sill and lean forward, place my hands on the floor, and begin to slide down into the room, which makes me think this was what it was like to be born. <laughs> Awkward. Too big for the passageway. Negotiate. Submit. When I give myself to gravity, there I am, inside, no harm, the dazzling splotchy flower heads scattered around me on the floor. Will leaving the world be the same? Uncertainty as to how to proceed, some discomfort, and suddenly you're where? I am so involved with this idea, I forget to unlock the door. So when I go to fetch the mail, I'm locked out again. <laughs> am I at home in this house? Would I prefer to be out here, where I could be almost anyone? This time, it's simpler. The window frame, the radiator, my descent. Born twice in one day. In their silver dug, these bruised, blessed flowers, how hard I had to work to bring them into this room. When I say spent, I don't mean they have no further coin. If there are lives to come, I think they might be a little easier than this one.